Raising the Bets is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to Raising the Bets, where a Catholic couple raising five kids outside of Boston join us as we share the joys and challenges of marriage, homeschool, and our adventures near and far as we make sense of the world and experience the best parts of our culture. I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. Melanie, let's start with some feedback we got from our last episode. Oh, wow. I had talked about going, taking the kids, uh, four of them, to the Scouts Klondike Derby, and we speculated that Klondike Derby was a northern scout thing. Uh Uh-huh. But we are wrong. And in fact, uh, B sent an email uh, with a link to the Longhorn Council, which is from your neck of the woods. Longhorn would be Texas, I'm guessing. Yes, the Longhorn Council is located between Waco and Austin. So really your neck of the woods. Oh, yeah. And uh, they had something called, in fact, it was uh, next weekend. The they have a Klondike Derby coming up at Camp Tahuahaya. What? <laughs> I'm not trying to pronounce that. T a h u a y a, Tahuaya. Tahuaya. Hoi hoi hoi. I would I would think Tahuaya. Hoi hoi. Okay. So anyway, it is an uh, Klondike Derby and a traditional scouting, winter camping, and outdoor skills competition. They have sleds. The sleds are wheeled. Like ours were had wheels that take off. Ours ours had wheels. Yes, but ours are wheels until it's time for the race and then they take off. But I like there is not a chance of snow where where the, the in There's the, a minuscule chance. A minuscule that, chance not, of a dusting a zero, of snow. Not a zero. Yeah. But they also they could have a Klondike sled or a wheeled miniature Conestoga or Prairie Schooner wagon, which would be kind of awesome. But you know, it sounds like they do a combination of what of two separate events that we have. So in this winter, we have the Klondike Derby. And in the summer, they do something called the Chuck Wagon. The Chuck Wagon Derby? Right. No, just the Chuck Wagon. Oh, I <laughs> thought it was Chuck Wagon Derby. Well, it sort of is. Actually, there's no race. They don't. Ah. Do they race the wagons? I don't think they race the Chuck Wagons. But it it's apart from that, which I can't. It's been so long since actually they had a Chuck Wagon. I don't remember. But um, apart from that, it's it's kind of the same thing. They each unit either a patrol or or pack has a wagon uh and during the day they t- they they the wagon carries their gear and they go from station to station practicing scouting skills right it's the same klondike and chuck wagon and this sounds like they just do them both at once so oh, um cool. the participants can serve as the draft animal of their choice dogs horses oxen or mules depending on the vehicle they bring so they pull the sleds or right. wagons um <laughs> Acting as, as dogs reminds me of the Swallows and Amazons kids when they are in winter holiday when they make the sleds. Oh, yes. And they call themselves uh, sled dogs. Yes. Man, those th- like the sleds on the ice, those things sounded awesome. <laughs> it sounded like so much fun. Especially with, with the sail up. Yeah. Yeah. So pretty cool. So they can do Conestoga wagons or prairie schooners. So um, what's the difference, you say? I, I was going to ask, what's the difference between a Conestoga and a Prairie Schooner? Because I well, let me don't inform know. you uh, uh, with the help of the Longhorn Council, which says Conestoga wagons were huge freight wagons with an arching weather cover or bonnet developed in Pennsylvania by descendants of German colonists and used for hauling freight throughout the East and on the Santa Fe Trail to New Mexico. For prairie schooners, so the Conestoga wagons were too heavy for their draft animals on most rugged western trails. The much smaller prairie schooners were developed specifically for overland travel and saw wide use throughout many of America's western migrations, migrations, easy for me to say, to the latest gold rush fields. Many travelers simply retrofitted their standard farm wagons with a canvas bonnet. The popular right. trek carts from the early days of scouting were a single axle adaptation of the famous frontier wagons and their trademark trademark canvas bonnets. Oh, cool. Uh, t- to be honest, I did not know that distinction, but that makes sense. The ne- neither did I, honestly. Uh and you are from the Conestoga wagon country. Shame on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. That's kind of cool. I 
I, I kind of I, I'm I'm fascinated by scouting in different parts of the country and the different ways they experience it. Right. So it's kind of cool that they that they 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 thank you, B, for sending that along. Yes, yeah, very very enlightening. Yes. All right, so let's talk about what we've been doing. Uh, so you had dinner with a friend, and so people who've been listening to SQPN shows for a long time will perhaps remember the Secrets of Battlestar Galactica, which was one of the first shows I started listening to back when Battlestar Galactica was on. Uh, Gosh, 10 years ago, probably more than 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. And that show was done by our friends, Jeff and Zena Liss. And uh, we've become friends with Jeff and Zena, which yes. is fun. Yeah, Zena's fourth child, Emma, was born within a couple of weeks of a uh, couple of weeks after Lucy was born. And Emma and Lucy have been best friends and grown up together since the time they were crawling babies when yep. we met up at one of the uh, CNMC conferences the 2010 in boston yeah yeah that's right now what could have been 2010 because oh, it was the second lucy CNMC. was born in 2013 right so okay so but yeah. Zena and i did meet in the, two, the 2010 one which was when ben was a crawling baby and i think Zena had oh, myra right ben crawling around that's that's who i'm remembering yes yep so um so Zena yeah. and i met up met up for dinner Oh, we haven't seen each other in far too long. Well, before the pandemic, Since probably. Before the pandemic, yeah, unfortunately. And it was lovely. We met up at a uh, Greek restaurant in Dedham, uh, which if you live in the area, I highly recommend. It's it's in Dedham Square. It's uh, Cuisina... Cuisina Estario, I think. Estant oh, no. Oh, no, I, I always mess up the name. It starts with an E-S-T. S-D- Estiatorio. Estiatorio. E-S-T-I-A-T-O-R-I-O. -E Estiatorio. Yes. Super, super good Greek food. Yes. Uh, we shut down the Greek restaurant. Then we headed over to uh, the bookstore. And then we shut down the bookstore. And then we stood in the parking <laughs> lot and talked until we were icicles. And then we, <laughs> we said a good night and went home. It was, it was a really, really fun night. Um, so good to see Zena again. Cool. Oh, that's the Amazon. That's you went to Legacy Place. Okay. Yes. Uh, I see. Yeah. That's um. Yeah. I actually that is new since the last time I've been to Legacy Place. Again, because you know we've been <laughs> in hibernation for the last two years. So cool. Oh well, and that's great that you went and saw Zena and uh, you had a night out. That was a lot of fun. I spent the night in with the kids. We had pizza and wings, and then we said prayers. And uh, uh, they didn't report on me that I did. I kind of um, made funnies during the prayers. You always make funnies during the prayers. Yes, I know. Some of the phrases are you're, just funny. You are not a great influence sometimes. <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, we, you know, and then they went to bed and I watched something. I forget. And I came home way after they were in bed. Yes, you did. Uh, and then that was, so that was Thursday night? No, that was Friday night. That was Friday night. So, oh, oh yes, because before that, Thursday night into Friday, we had that storm that blew through. And around four, five o'clock in the morning, was it four, four or five o'clock in the morning, the power b blinked, which because we have smart lights, when it blinks, the lights come on. Oh my gosh, that's so annoying. <laughs> well... I woke I was sound asleep and dreaming and then suddenly in my dream something was bright was stabbing me in the eyes and I woke up and the lights were on like so bright there you have an option you can have the lights either go, stay off when the power comes back which is annoying if it's if if you if, if are you, awake and you want the lights to the be lights on. be on because then you can't then you don't have the little powers back or you can have them come on. So in the kids' rooms, the lights stay off when the power comes back. I, th I think they should stay off in all the bedrooms, frankly. Well, I suppose. Well, they came back. It came back on. Well, the, the the problem is, is you can't turn them off until everything reboots. The so, system. So, so it's not only did the lights come on, but they, they're on. They and stay on, on for and about on five and minutes and and, oh. until the Wi-Fi restarts and that sort of thing. Yeah, so annoying. So I get the, all the lights off. We went back to bed. And then the power went off again, just for good. And then, so that was, oh, maybe within a half hour after that. So I was up. I, 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 but at that point, I'm like, I can't sleep now uh, because I had a full day of work I had needed to do that I couldn't do. So I got up, took a cold shower, 
And then I got the generator out of the shed and got that going. So that's the first time we've used the generator for a power outage, which it worked out well. Yeah. Uh, I was able to plug in the toaster oven, the tea kettle, and the uh, uh, Keurig. So we had coffee and bagels, and that was good. People had hot food and hot drink. Yeah, very important. Also, to the, to the benefit, the weather, it was like 60 degrees out. It had actually been so warm when I went to bed uh, Thursday night that I was like hot and pulling off blankets. So mm -hmm. the house didn't get cold, fortunately. Right. So after we were done with breakfast, I plugged in the freezer to the generator and then I left that going because we had taken stuff out of the freezer. And if you open up a stand up freezer, it gets you you lose all the cold. You really got to plug it back in. So I plugged it back in. And then after a while, you took the kids for a walk. And you can talk about that in a second. But uh, I was thinking, oh, you know, I really ought to plug in the the fridge. But plugging the fridge is such a pain because you got to pull the whole fridge out. And I'm pulling this fridge out. And it's really a tight quarters. And I finally got it out. And I plug it in. Five, literally less than five minutes later, the power came back. <laughs> Of course. Of course. But uh, so it came back around like 1130, close to noon. And uh, then I had to rush, rush, rush to get work done. I had a board meeting. It was it was it was a crazy afternoon. And that's why I ended up by getting pizza instead of cooking dinner because you were going out and I totally spaced. And it was 530, I think, by the time I was like, wait a minute, who's making dinner? And yeah, so but you took the kids for a walk. We went for. Yeah, it was really nice. I mean, it's hard for them to get school work done when the power is out. I for the older kids, like Bella couldn't do any work because everything her checklist and or is, is on her computer. Right, everything's online on Google Docs and that sort of uh, stuff. Yeah, and so we just we took the morning off. We went for a nice long walk. It was good. Um, then the, when the power came back on, I gave the kids the option to do school and earn screen time or you could skip school but you're not going to get time on the screen and yeah um ben ben opted to earn screen time by doing his schoolwork. anthony and lucy opted to just take the morning off <laughs> take the afternoon off and the morning off oh uh, well, we did uh we did actually do read alouds in the afternoon oh so okay it, was, it wasn't complete no school day but it was okay. it was a lighter school day it was nice so and bella Bella was glad that power came back on in time for her to do her uh, D and D virtual campaign. Right, right. She does the D and D group online with the kids from homeschooling group. Um, so, and then today, Sunday, was Anthony's birthday. So we he's eleven. He is eleven now. And so, uh, got up, opened presents, and uh, that was done relatively early, which was nice. Which means, because in order to open presents, they had to get dressed for a church. Yeah. Getting, get, getting. The... I am, I am, finally savvy <laughs> enough to realize that if I hold out the stick of you get to open your presents, I can get them carrot. to <laughs> carrot. Yes, thank you. Oh my gosh! If I hold out the dangling carrot of opening presents, then they will actually get dressed. They really resist getting dressed on Sundays. I don't know why. Oh, it is like it, the mass is at ten thirty. We have to leave the house by. 10 10 i cannot get them to get dressed before like 10 o'clock oh my gosh it is like pulling like it is such a hassle although but the last two weeks have been much better although we almost left without ben today <laughs> I, oh goodness. poor ben on um saturday night he had insomnia and he came in at midnight and said i can't sleep um, yeah he'd been try laying and, in bed and he's one of the first to bed like he's he, he goes to bed early yeah, he'd been laying in bed and just now sometimes he thinks he hasn't gone to sleep when he actually did drift off and then woke back up again. So right. I don't know. But he was really tired this morning and I was chatting with the girls and we were having a really interesting conversation. And then I realized, oh, it's time to get ready to go. And so I was like, OK, everybody get your coats on and your boots on and everything. And I was in the car warming it up because we've determined that it's best if I don't do the trying to herd the ducks out the door um, yeah, because that never ends well. So it's better if I just go start the car and wait in the car. Right. And somehow I, because I was distracted by conversing with the, continuing my conversation with the girls, I totally forgot to herd Ben along. So I get the other four kids out the door. I get myself out the door last and 
lock the door behind me and I'm heading to the car. I, I, I pull the van sliding door shut. But as I'm pulling it shut, the kids are like, Wait, where's Ben? Where's Ben? What about Ben? <laughs> and then at the door, the door opens to the house and there's put Ben appears shoeless like, hey, are you guys <laughs> leave without me. I, I honestly thought he was in the car. So, I mean, I knew he wasn't in the car. So we were we weren't going to leave without him. Although I, if we it have, had been up to me, I would have left without yeah. without Ben. Oh my goodness! We have uh, threat in the past. We have threatened that if you do not get your shoes on right now, you are staying here alone <laughs> while we go to church. Uh, I thought that was maybe that's what was happening this week, but uh, no. So you went in, you we got him together and got him out <laughs> poor, to the car. Poor kid, poor guy. But uh, yeah, so we all got to mass t- this week. Um, so yeah, Anthony's birthday. We, what did we get him? It was it was not the best present uh, piled this year for various reasons. Partly because we, we got him some duplicate gifts. We already have that book. I already have that. We we have three of that Lego I, set. I had him sit down in front of the Amazon wish list and tell me what he already had and didn't have, and what he wanted and didn't want. But I did it like a week before I actually sat down to order. But but he he had vetoed several things and I took dutifully took them off the list. So I assumed that everything that was still on the list was something that he would want for his birthday. Yeah. But yep. it was a couple of the other kids who were like, no, we already have that book. Um, yep. Anthony himself didn't remember that we already had it. So that one was kind of on him. But then the Lego set was one that he didn't have and he didn't mind getting. But the girls and Ben each had, had the already, same set had the same set and they all said well we don't mind getting duplicate sets we like having the sets and- but i think that he would have been a little bit happier to get he didn't seem disappointed right but he i think he might have been a little happier if he'd got a completely new set that nobody had before but i think yeah. he also recognized and this was actually really mature of him i think he recognized that there were very few sets that we didn't already have we have pretty much all of the star wars lego sets that we can afford so i think i think he was resigned and he was yeah. not super disappointed he did not seem disappointed in but he, gifts. he didn't go for any of the, the marvel lego sets huh the, you know we looked at a lot of marvel lego sets there wasn't anything that was really great yeah they, they the marvel lego sets are kind of lame yeah I, I i gotta say that's disappointing uh, Father Andrew was showing me that uh, he he got a, a new Mandalorian Lego set for Christmas that he hasn't put together yet that he that doesn't seem too expensive so maybe we should look at that. And he's you probably already have it. Yeah, and Anthony's due for a new bike. Right, so I think that that's we'll, going to happen soon. Yeah, we'll make that part of his presents too. Uh, so then we went out to dinner, uh, as is our tradition. As you probably know, if you've listened for any length of time, is we take that the child whose birthday it is gets to choose where to go for dinner. I know people, different people have different traditions. Like my sister, they have eight kids, so it would be prohibitively expensive for the entire family to go out to dinner. So there's every time. Every time. And because there's so many of them, there will be so many dinners. <laughs> so they have it where the, the child and one parent go out to dinner, and they usually go to a fairly fancy uh, place for dinner. And, and, and the kid gets to pick which parent and which. And where to go for dinner. Which is a nice tradition, actually. And maybe as they get older, we'll we'll do that. But ours is we all go. Um, Anthony picked chilies. And which we've done a lot before. It, yeah, it's, it's a sort of family favorite. He loves the chips and salsa and he loves the pepperoni pizza. <laughs> chilies. It's, it's a very mediocre pepperoni pizza. But yeah, it's his it's he just likes chilies. Yeah. We have but we've decided that. From now on, we're going to try to dissuade the children from choosing chilies, at least our chilies here and where we are. It, it, it has gone downhill. It's definitely gone downhill. The menu, like uh, corporately, the menu is really a lot shorter than it was. It's very limited. Yeah. I, I feel like there's not nearly as much selection. My sister used to work at Chili's back in the day, and I used to enjoy going there. Like, it wasn't the best food ever, but I used to enjoy dinners out at yeah. Chili's and I feel like now there's just not much I, I kind of look over the menu and I'm like there's nothing really here that I'm really excited about there isn't a whole lot of like southwestern or Tex-Mex sort of stuff on it there's like there's still a f- like fajitas and there's a you know a few tacos and things but not much it's, you know there's I mean, there's never hugely Tex-Mex I guess but yeah I, I mean it's called Chili's it should be more southwestern than it is 
But in any case, um, the the service was uh, like a lot of places. It's hard to blame that. I mean, most places are understaffed now. Right. But the service wasn't great. Like we got there and they're like, well, we just seated a a group of eight and you're seven. So it's going to be 40 minutes before you can we can seat you. And it's like, oh, that's that's I know. And we we were the only people waiting. (laughs) Like everybody else who came in got seated right away. It was I, I was just like annoyed that we ended up having to wait for forty minutes. And then when we got seated, like it just wasn't great. It was you know the they they brought the drinks half full milks for the kids, and didn't we didn't get drinks again until we asked for them at the end of the meal. You know it just took forever. Right. She, she was way too busy to ask us if we needed refills on drinks. And like I said, I get it. There most restaurants are understaffed, so it's hard to blame them, but. I just it just seems like every the last few times we've been to Chili's have been disappointing. So I, I'm going to try to like I would rather go to like I mentioned before the, our local um, Mexican restaurant uh, Sombreros, which is great. And it's a family run place. They're not going to be understaffed because it's a family, you know, and the the food is better and, and all that. So and so maybe Sophie will go there for her birthday, which is coming up in a week or so. Ten days. Which means you get to buy birthday presents. Oh, goodness. <laughs> if, if Anthony was hard to buy for, Sophie's even harder. Oh, even harder. For. Yeah. 14-year-old 14, 14 girls? What do you yeah. buy? I was going to say 13, but she's going to be 14. Yeah, non-girly 14-year-old girls. She's, uh... She is not a girly girl. She's not a stereotype. She she already got, like, new sheets for for Christmas. Um, She doesn't really love clothes, and she's... Yeah. She's got a she's got a Kindle, she's got an iPad. Mm-hmm. She has headphones for her Kindle. She doesn't like she doesn't need a lot of stuff or want a lot of stuff. She's not very materialistic. She's not yep. very acquisitive. So it's kind of hard. And she's you know, she's not really toys. I'll probably end up getting her some Star Wars black figures cuz she and Bella do collect those yep. and and play with them. So those are usually pretty safe, like Bad Batch black figures. Also, maybe some camping stuff. Yeah, some scouting campy yeah, stuff, yeah. maybe. I think that might be a, a, um, in the, uh, a good choice. I mean, clothing, yeah, she, maybe maybe she, some T-shirts or... T-shirts, yes. Uh, and maybe shoes? Anyway, we'll figure that anyway, out. We'll do it on yeah. the show. Sorry, folks. Uh, so, <laughs> um, let's talk about food. For Anthony's birthday, you made him, he requested a... He wanted a cheesecake. Anthony loves cheesecake. In fact, I was looking at our Facebook memories. He asked for a cheesecake when he was five. So this is a long-standing Anthony tradition. Yes. Um, but the thing about Anthony is he likes different flavored cheesecakes, but he gets very anxious about the cheesecake sampler plate because he can't try all of them he can't have all of them and he can't choose among them and so we usually end up getting stuck with just the plain new york cheesecake but he really likes other flavors so he wanted a chocolate amaretto cheesecake with raspberry swirl like this is like the <laughs> ultimate and i am like oh yeah i love the way you think like um, chocolate amaretto is one of my favorite and so is raspberry swirl and you put them all together and this is like the ultimate cheesecake so good um so i decided to make it with a chocolate crust i went to the store to buy more cream cheese because we were running low and it is the great cream cheese uh uh, paucity of 2022 so while i was there i was looking around thinking well i could get oreos for my crust i could buy a pre-made crust but those are never as good um but Anthony had mentioned the possibility of getting chocolate graham crackers. And so I went to the cracker and cookie aisle and they didn't have chocolate graham crackers, but they had chocolate Teddy Grahams. And I'm thinking this could work. So I got a box of Teddy Grahams and I pulverized them and I added like a quarter cup of almond flour, a little bit, a couple t- tablespoons of sugar and some butter. And that made the best crust. So good. Slightly nutty from the almond flour, very richly chocolatey from the Teddy Grahams. And mm-hmm. that butter just kind of, oh, it's so good. Yeah. Um, then it was a chocolate cheesecake. So it, uh, 
melted some chocolate chips in and um, added amaretto plus some almond extract. extract. Yeah. Because I think the amaretto by itself doesn't quite have enough almond kick to it. So I did both. Uh, and then I made a raspberry swirl. So I had to look at two different recipes. One for the raspberry swirl cheesecake and one for the chocolate amaretto cheesecake because nobody does both. Not not until now. <laughs> now everybody will do it. Right. Um, and the, the raspberry swirl cheesecake, I found, had you mix seedless raspberry jam with lemon juice to kind of thin it out and then swirl that into the cheesecake. So I did that. We didn't have seedless raspberry jam, but we had the not the... Raspberry jam from our local farmer's market ladies, which is not super seedy. Like, it's got seeds in it, but they're not hard and crunchy. Yeah. They're very unobtrusive. I like the idea of, of mixing it with a little bit of lemon juice because the, the straight up jam would be too sweet. Right. The, the lemon juice cut the sweet and it made it a little bit thinner so it was easier to swirl. That worked really well. The, the, the swirl wasn't really visible. And that was okay, but the flavor was there. Like you would get nice little pockets of raspberries popping out at you as you ate. And that was perfect. And then after I'd cooked the cheesecake and cooled it, I topped it with a chocolate uh, amaretto ganache. So you just melt chocolate chips and cooks and heat up some heavy cream. And you mix those together with a little bit more amaretto and another dash of uh, almond extract. And I, you know, I sloshed that around on top. Now, I definitely needed a ganache because I overfilled my pan. <laughs> As and, you always do when you're making cheesecake. Oh, my Lord. I need to get a bigger cheesecake pan. And I know which one I need to get because my friend Rebecca, every time I complain about this, says you need to get this cheesecake pan. And she gives me the Amazon link and I never remember to buy it. And this time I'm going to. <laughs> um, it. I, I knew it was going to overflow. I even put some of the excess batter into a little ramekin to make a little mini cheesecake, and it still overflowed. Oh, yeah, that was it way overflowed. There was way too much. There was way too much, too much batter. Yeah. And it said nine inch cheesecake, but well, and I used a nine inch pan. No, you were granted, also combining two different recipes, so that would have changed some things. Right. I mean, th there was only like a third of a cup of raspberry jam, so it shouldn't have like. Overflow. And I took out more the, than a third a cup of the batter. But the, the way it cooks might be like the, the lift that you get from the different things might be different, too. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. it was it, it was not a pretty cheesecake. It was kind of a. It, yeah, it wasn't a disaster. It just kind of rose up in giant crags. It was kind stuff. of a fluffy cheesecake monster thing. <laughs> um, but the taste was phenomenal. And if looks mattered, you could have carved off some of the the the, the risen bits the the, the edges right. I, because the ganache is going to cover all that yeah if, if i'd wanted to make it look pretty like if i was taking it to a, an actual party i could have right like sli carefully sliced away the excess on the edges and smoothed out the top with a knife and then poured the ganache over it and that would have covered a multitude of sins <laughs> and nope and nobody would have me. noticed no one would have ever known yeah but <laughs> It was really good. I, I was very pleased with the way this came out, and I want to make it again. Yeah, no, it was really good. Really, I mean, very rich dessert. Frankly, you know, honestly, I, mean, it was, I think a small slice did me well. Oh, yeah, you did not need a very big slice of this. It was super rich. <laughs> but super good. Like, man, if you like it, any of those flavors in the combination, it was really good. Oh, so good. I... Yeah, so. Uh, so that's what we've been cooking. Uh, we've made some other things, too, but uh, that's the only uh, interesting one to talk about uh, this time. Let's talk about, uh, because we're halfway through, let's talk about what we've been reading or watching, because we neither of us have finished a book this week. We are both getting really slow at reading stuff lately. But, uh, so slow. Uh, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm juggling two different books and not making fast progress on either one. I'm hopeful to finish the book I'm reading this week, uh, so that's for sure. All right, so... We were fans of the first season of the of a Netflix show called Raising Dion. It it's about so good. a single mom who's got a little boy who she's like a, she's a widow raising a little boy who starts having powers. And he's like, I think, six in the first season. I, I thought he was five or six in the first season. Yeah. It, it felt like he jumped more than a year of age because he's eight in the. Yeah, he's more. He's like 
well, it's been two years since the first season. So uh, it, it, it was pre pre 2020, pre pandemic. So it's been a while. In any case, um, he has these powers. Other people are starting to show powers. She's trying to figure out what's going on and why he's got it. It's got something to do with how his dad died. And I really I liked the characters. It was a huge twist in the first season. I loved the show. Yeah. I, I really liked the take of, I don't know, the, the just the parent. It was it was as much a show about like her being a parent, a single mom, as it was about him having superpowers. And I really yeah. liked the story, the yeah. characters. There was something about her. I really liked her as a person, the, the yes. mom. There was some character trait in her, some something in her that really was like i really like her <laughs> she's a good person right. she was it was interesting her story backstory was really interesting because she was a dancer and kind of not a very serious student and kind of didn't exactly know who she was outside of dancing and she's kind of given up dancing when she got pregnant and wanted to go back to it but couldn't and i really liked the fact that she had something about her that she was passionate about and she loved that was not just being a mom mm -hmm. but that she was also made, willing to make the sacrifice to be a mom you know she she gave up on her dancing in order to right to be a mom because she she needed to do the hard thing i i really liked i don't know that was that was part of her character that i enjoyed mm -hmm. And then she got in a few of the, the uh, episodes to dance and her, her joy in the dance and her movement. It was just really nice to see a mom who had a passion and there was still room in her life for her passion. Yes. I think that was part of it. It was, it was nice. You know, you don't get to see that very often. Right. And then, and her relationship with her son was good. I was oh, like, she was such a good mom. Right. Not that she Not never perfect. made perfect. Yeah. Not that she made mistakes or was perfect, but she was a good mom doing her best in a hard situation, making some tough calls, who really had a great rapport with her son. I yes. So, first season ended with um, the expected resolution of the with a big bad guy. Not a, not a complete one hundred percent. Everything is solved and we're done now, but a resolution. Second season just just came out on Netflix. And so we watched, we've only seen the first episode so far. Oh, and then there's a little girl in the wheelchair, Hope. Esperanza. Esperanza. Hope, yeah, Esperanza, who is just fantastic. She is just, right. she's an awesome little spitfire. Dion, Dion's best friend. She is, yeah, she's, I, I think, love the actress. I she's think she great. has cerebral palsy or something, something like that. There's they never some, really talk about what her diagnosis is. She has is. some sort of degenerative disease. The, the actress herself does. And so that char character does. And but she's a little spitfire. She's kind of awesome. And, uh, and she becomes sort of his, his Dion's coach and cheerleading squad. And she just she's such a good friend character. Mm -hmm. um, and then he also has one other friend who who was a previously a bully, but has become a friend. Right. And yeah. I liked that character arc, too. The, the, the bully becomes the friend. So. Um, the second season begins. So now instead of having the big baddie being this supernatural figure the crooked man um who still does kind of exist but i don't want to spoil anything but the bad there's a bad guy quote unquote who is another kid and that's not really a spoiler because you find that out like at the very beginning of the first episode of this of this second season and it's kind of refreshing because also the corporation that's involved in all this is this big company we thought were the bad guys last season and now they're not the bad guys. Or maybe not. It's, it's interesting. It's, this is a question about it, but it doesn't seem to be following the trope and cliche. So, so far, so good. Again, it's the first episode, so we haven't, we haven't seen much of the second season, so we'll see how that goes. But uh, So far, I like it. Yeah, we both enjoy that. And, and we had the, the mom trying to, to decide whether or not she wants to date, and that's kind of an interesting tension in her life, too. Mm -hmm. Right. And she's trying to juggle, you know, having a superhero powered, super powered son, trying Good to have job. a normal life, trying to keep his secret identity. It's kind of fun. 
So that's Raising Dion. And then we watched uh, the next movie in the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe, another superhero thing, uh, with the kids. Today we watched Guardians of the Galaxy 2, which was uh, super fun. They, I think, I think the Guardians are, is, are their favorite group so far. They're the Guardians the f- are, f- they're are the just funniest. fun and, and funny. I had, I had to say, I think Drax is the funniest one in this one, in this oh, movie. Yeah. He just has some of the funniest lines. Like, <laughs> Mantis, look out. <laughs> this character, Mantis, gets, like, pummeled, like, labeled, taken out of the scene, literally, by a boulder. And then a beat later, he yells, Mantis, look out. <laughs> it's just, like, so funny. And also, this is the one where Quill calls a, um, Rocket a trash panda. And I remember the first time I saw that, I thought that was the <laughs> funniest thing to call a raccoon ever. And so that's from now on, that's what raccoons are to me. They are trash pandas. Yeah. I mean, there's just so many funny moments. I have to say, watching it with the kids, there were a few cringe moments. Oh, yeah. I was just like, oh, please let that have gone over their head. There, oh. There's a little bit more crude body humor in this one yes. than I was really comfortable Direct with. Direct reference as a to a body part that sort of thing yeah Yeah, there's a little bit more of that than i was comfortable with frankly as a parent i kind of wish it was a bit more kid friendly so i've got some friends who when i said that we'd watched it said oh yeah we skipped the guardians movies i I can understand that as a judgment call everyone parents got to make it i think that i'm glad we watched it it was fun I can understand why one might want to skip it. If we were watching these just like rewatching these just before the kids watch them, we might have said on this one. Yeah. But it would be hard at this point to say we're not we're not going to watch the next one because so many of these build on each other, for, for one thing. Like, the, I know one we're not going to watch is Eternals because it was just wasn't that good of a movie to begin with. And there's a couple of things in that just go even further beyond the line than I'm comfortable with. Uh, but yeah, there was a couple of things because it has to do with where Quill, Peter Quill came from and his dad, who is this immortal being. And yeah, so that has to come up. It's very much about fatherhood and him being embodied and yeah. But there are themes of family again, Marvel movies, themes about family. I, I love, loved, loved the themes about family in this particular movie, especially. I mean, you've got Quill's dad, Ego, mm-hmm. the gigantic super god being. The super ego. <laughs> right. But then you also have his adopted dad, uh, Yondu. Yondu, who. I'm Mary Poppins, y'all. <laughs> who, who is really a fabulous character who has a redemption arc. I yep. love Yondu's redemption arc. And Yondu is far from perfect, as we as they say. Very far from perfect. <laughs> Very far from perfect. But but yet he he loved Peter and considered him a son. Yeah, and I thought that his, like I said, his redemption was absolutely pitch perfect. Yeah, and then you have Gamora and Nebula, the sisters arc. Right, the 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 sisters who were essentially raised by an abusive stepfather who were pitted against each other, as often happens in abusive families. And so they love each other, but they also resent each other and they don't know how to love because they've been so used to being pitted as enemies. They want, both of them want to go beyond that enemy relationship, but they don't know how. Right. Without the, without the enemy, they're not sure what they have. Right. They're not sure how to relate. And yet, I can, but yet yeah, you see them both of them longing for the other to be different, mm-hmm. for the other to accept, and I really liked the, the tensions there. It was funny, is like all of the families in this movie are, apart from the one blood relationship, are all sort of adopted uh, families. Adoptive. There's another word I'm trying to think of, but yeah, like um, it's not pseudo family, but you know what I mean. But the, the families of choice rather than families of blood, right? And, and, you know, they explicitly so. And, like, there's one point where they even talk about, like, um, the, the bickering among them. But, sure, that, you know, we're, but we're family. That doesn't matter. Right. I mean, I love the fact that the Guardians are a family. They are a family by choice of misfits who've come together and who have 
decided to trust and love each other. And this movie, I think the first movie is sort of about them coming together, but this movie is about them realizing as a group that they are a family. Right. And my, my favorite moment, I think, is Rocket's moment. I think he gets the best when he decides to, to cut and run because I can't afford to lose another family member today. That well, line... Not when he cuts and runs, when he stops Gamora. Well, he stops Gamora, that's right. But, but he's also willing to abandon one family member because I can't lose everybody. He's, he's going to save everybody else. And... For, for a Rocket who has been essentially an incredibly self-centered, selfish character to A, acknowledge that they are his family and B, be willing to sacrifice one for the sake of the of rest. the others, yeah. Like, it, it was a really poignant moment. And I really, I loved that Rocket was this crude, rude, self-centered character is able to have that moment of, of deep humanity. Right. Yet another, I, I love the trope in movies of the alien being, non-human being, who turns out to be more human than a lot of the right. actual humans. And Rocket is a great yep. example of that, that trope. So uh, you also finished Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. all seven seasons? I did. I really liked Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D all seven seasons <laughs> it in the later seasons i will grant you it gets weird weird <laughs> and kind of corny and kind of comic booky yeah but i don't know sometimes comic booky bothers me i really thought that almost all of the decisions they made in agents of shield worked there were a couple things that I quibbles I had that I wish they had they had gone one way instead of another. But on the whole, I really liked the characters. I liked the choices that they made. I liked the stories that they told. Again, another show about the same the same sort of idea, a family, a family of choice, of choice, people who have come together and they're more than just a team, though. They really are a family. And. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Family is. So important. I think I watched S.H.I.E.L.D. over time, you know, as it came out episode by episode. I enjoyed it. But I think if I'd watched it like you did all at once, um, as, you know, the, the one an episode after another without waiting and no time between seasons, I might have I might have came to the same conclusion you did. Like the same I had the same enjoyment that you did. But this this being stretched out in in. Between this, the fifth and the sixth and seventh seasons, there was a huge gap. And I, I think that where I wasn't even sure whether it was coming back or not. And I think in my mind after the fifth season and there was this question, I kind of had turned it off. Like I mean, in my head, like the, oh, I guess it's not coming back. And I, you know, I'm no longer looking forward to it. And so when it did come back, I didn't have the same appreciation. Right. I think I also was able to see how even though each season is kind of its own thing, especially to the end, they all did fit together into one sort of mega arc. Mm -hmm. And I think that watching them as they came out, that might not have been quite as apparent because they feel at first like they're very disjointed. Right. Um, but yeah, I, okay. I liked it. And then the, the final thing we watched together this week, we watched last night, was we watched Dune, the, the mega movie, yes. the Denis Villeneuve the, epic. The, the most recent Dune. Yes. And um, so I think we both concluded that it looks fabulous. It was so gorgeous. Yeah. The design, the costumes, the sets. The cinematography, just the, it, like there were scenes that were just like a painting. It was like just... You want to stop the screen and hang it on the wall. I mean, just gorgeous shots. Be beautiful. Well-designed, yeah. well-shot movie. On the other hand, I think that this would be a story that would be very hard to follow if you didn't know the books and didn't know the story already. I cannot right. imagine trying to follow what was going on if it I... Had never read the books. Had never read the books. I read the first book once 30 years ago. So I have a basic framework in my head plus i edited all of the secrets of movies and tv shows episodes uh, that we did a whole series on the various iterations of dune 
uh, movies and TV series, uh, you know, mini series. And so, uh, so I had the framework in my head, but yeah, it was, it's a lot. And it's only the first part of the story. Right. I, I, it's been a long time since I read Dune, but when I was a teen, I read it multiple times. So the, the characters and a lot of the plot moments are very deeply ingrained. And a lot of it felt very familiar in a sort of, oh, yeah, I really liked this scene. I mm-hmm. really liked this moment. Um, but there was a lot that I had forgotten or didn't remember. Um, I remember being surprised as we were watching that they had made the doctor into a, a woman because it was a male character in the book. Right. Um, which worked. I mean, it was it was it was a scene that I, a, a choice that I thought. It didn't feel like, oh, we need to be more woke and have a woman in this role. I don't think it never felt like that. It was just I think they just went with the best actor that they had available. Right. And and she was she was really good. She was really good. I really liked uh, the the woman who played uh, Dr. Lee King's Keens. And. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, from my point of view, as someone who has. um who only saw the, read the books once a long time ago, I found some of it a, a little bit confusing, like the visions of things that were to come, but which m- maybe are contradictory, like either this bad thing is going to happen or this good thing is I found that a little confusing, the, the visions. Yes. Um, also, back to the design, the, 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 the look of it, I find the... The 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 sci-fi films which have this bleak, empty design of the world to be kind of ugh. like whether it's uh, Blade Runner or it's this like these brutalist architecture sort of homes with with minimal furniture or no furniture and no decorations, no artwork or whatever. It just feels very inhuman or or there is artwork, but it's very outsized like those giant mural things there was no personal art and it's like i just i don't know whether it's a dennis villeneuve thing or a french filmmaker thing or i don't know what but i I just don't i don't really like that design i i really liked the look of it i thought it was beautiful i wouldn't want to live there (laughs) right but i think that there's a distinction between like is this the kind of place that some people, I mean, I people have houses that I wouldn't want to personally live in, I think, that feel kind of cold and inhuman. Okay. So do I buy it as, like, would people build houses that look like this and live in them? Well, sure. I, I see people building houses that I think are cold and inhuman and living in them all the time. It's... Yeah. Um, but it seems to be a, a, a pattern in certain uh, areas of sci-fi movies. I suppose. Um, they're very dystopian feeling futures, that's for sure. Well, yes. I mean, I, I really felt one of the things I was noting as we watched that I don't remember catching when I was a much younger and less sophisticated reader is what a bleak future Dune portrays. Mm-hmm. The, uh, even the Atreides, who are supposed to be the good guys, are very militaristic. And like the society on every level is very militarized like and politicized and politicized like the atreides like at one point duke leto says we hold arrakis by power of sea and land like they don't hold it by well, caladan their uh, caladan right. their their home world not by by ruling well but by military might by power by power yeah it's all about power and power struggles and there's no there's no Mm non-political realm of life in that universe i suppose that's supposed to contrast with the fremen who live by you know the connection to the to the land and to the creatures and yes the fremen the fremen are not as politically motivated although i think later in the series they they do actually have a lot more right um yeah it's very it is very dystopian it's but it's a but it, the movie itself it was good um the 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 
Timothy Chalamet as Paul Atreides. I, I really liked him. Yeah, he was a great Paul Atreides. He, he felt a little young, but maybe that worked. Like you would tell, you kind of convinced me. I think that uh, younger does work. He's been portrayed older in in some of the other adaptations. I, I felt like this was true to the book. I don't remember mm. how old he was supposed to be in the book, but I I thought that he was supposed to be fairly teens. fairly young. Yeah, yeah. late teens. Um, the the his mom was a little too hand ringy. I think we concluded. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't pinpoint where there was any departure from the book, but the overall impression, because I remember her doing the various things, but the overall impression I got from the movie, Jessica, was that she was less sure of herself than I remember my impression of her in the books. Like, yeah. In the books, she's kind of a force to be reckoned with. In the movies, I didn't get, there's a little bit of that, obviously, but. She also seems just a little bit less foreboding. I feel like Jason Momoa and um, oh, Gurney Halleck, um, he also played Thanos. What is his name? I forget. Never going to remember I the actor's remember. name. Anyway, they um, they they both were fine, but they didn't get a lot of time. You know, I feel like that's kind of a flaw in the book too, though. Yeah, in the book. Paul has multiple male role model role model friends. figures yeah. who are a part of his father's circle of friends and his household, I guess. Yeah. And it gives a sense of of kind of a richness in his life. Household retainers, essentially. Yeah. Right. And I like the fact that there are so many of them. But honestly, I, even from the books, I remember not really being able to keep them all straight. Right. And I, I, I guess that's sort of true in the movie too it's kind of hard to keep who everybody is and they don't get a lot of time right mostly what i got from that is a sense of paul having this sort of with thick rich world of not being around other kids but being around these this adults adult household yeah and uh oscar isaac as duke leto i thought was really good oh i loved him he was great yeah he was really good um Stellan Skarsgård was unrecognizable as Baron Harkonnen. I was shocked. I was like, wait, that was <laughs> Stellan Skarsgård? I, I had no idea. There were so many people from the MCU in it. So Stellan Skarsgård, you had uh, Dave Bautista as uh, the other Harkonnen. Uh, they, you had Oscar Isaac, who's going to be Moon Knight. And then uh, there was someone else. Um, anyway, but just, well, no, not Momo. He's in DC. But you, yeah, you get the, all these people coming over from MCU. It was kind of funny. Uh, so Dune. And long, and I, and I hate to say, I kind of started to fall asleep at the end, so I missed the last scene. We have to watch that again. It was it was a long movie, two and a half hours. So, um, and yet it didn't. Some it felt almost not quite long enough to actually do the story justice. Well, it, it obviously wasn't because there's there's more to come. They they it right. was it was in started as scene part one. So, I'm I'm hoping it was successful enough that they are going to make the the at least part two. Right. So that's what we've been watching. Let's uh, wrap up by talking about something you had you mentioned before. You were having a good conversation with the girls uh, this morning. Which what was caused me to almost forget Ben? Yes. So what was that about? Um, so the girls, they're both teens now, and we like we've talked about before. They're uh, more active socially online now with um, homeschooling the homeschool connections uh, cafe. And so now they're starting to encounter a lot more directly sort of the, the teen culture and encountering the, friends who've, who are struggling mm -hmm. with various things that teens, teens struggle yeah. with, um, you know, friends who are struggling with self-image, friends who are struggling with family issues, with, you know, losing, losing family members uh, and grief. And so... We were talking, they kind of mentioned that they had some friends who were struggling with, with body image issues. And this is not something that my girls have really encountered before. So we were having a really interesting conversation about like how we, our, our ideas of beauty are shaped by the culture at large and how the culture has a very distorted understanding of beauty. And um, 
gosh, it, it was it was kind of a conversation that was very wide ranging and went all over the place. But it was one of the things I liked was was the part where you guys were talking about the difference for today, how we perceive beauty today versus the way it would have been in the past. You know, today we get our images of beauty from the media, uh, you know, uh, actors and actresses and, you know, and they. They all have these, yeah, and they all have these impossible standards of beauty. You know, the like everyone in a movie is is attractive. You know, there are no unattractive people unless they are purposefully unattractive because of the bad guy or something. Um, whereas in real life, you have a range of, of attractiveness. And one of the things I've 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 been talk talk to people about a lot was like this idea that, and and then we talked about this. You know, if you lived in a medieval village, you the, the your world of people you were exposed to there were no photographs you know and there were right. paintings but the paintings were not photorealistic and and if you were a villager you probably didn't have a huge you knew about 30 40 maybe a couple hundred people and and your experience of art was probably art in your local church which may or may not be i mean even if it's of the highest yeah. quality it's not the same it's not photorealistic right right so your sense of what the way people looked would have been shaped by the 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 couple hundred people you, you were closest to, including family members. And so you, you you know you didn't have these impossible standards that we have now. And I, I think a lot of people, adults included, who end up alone or unhappy or just sort of you know never connecting with someone, never finding someone they're attracted to is because they've, cre they've created in their mind this idea that I'm only attracted to the, the sort of people that I'm seeing in the media, as opposed to this person who's here in front of me, who's a regular person, who's attractive in their own self, but not, you know, Chris Hemsworth or Scarlett Johansson, you know, but are just a regular person who is a perfectly attractive person. Right. When we talked about also, you know, God made each and every one of us and loves us as we are and finds us good and beautiful as we are. God's standards are definitely not human standards and vice versa. We 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 don't judge people based on how God would see them. Right. Um so it was a really good conversation. Yeah. I, I love teens are such a such a great age for actually really being able to dive into mm -hmm. topics like that uh, we were coming home from scouts the other day and i was talking to the girls about social media and how some of the other girls are online in various social media places and our girls they only have the the homeschool cafe and so it was like i don't want to be on <laughs> instagram or facebook or twitter or any of those places because that's just it just sounds like too much work and like they've they've heard from some of their homeschool friends about the other social media th uh, places and how toxic it can be for especially teen girls. To, right. You know, the, the Instagram is a huge element to that or it's Snapchat or any of these other visual ones where it's about posting pictures and having a, the perfect picture and certain pose or certain makeup or looks. And, and then, you know, if your friends don't like it, if you're one of the friends and you don't like, you know, put enough hearts and likes on things, well, then you're not a good friend and you get ostracized and you know, and then the bullying and all that other stuff. And it's like, and Sophie's like, that just sounds exhausting. I don't care. I don't want to do any of that. And I'm very grateful for the Homeschool Connections Cafe as an introduction to social media, which isn't, I mean, I'm sure it's not perfect. I'm sure there's some things that are slipped through, but it is moderated by adults. It's heavily moderated by adults. Yeah. Um, Heavily moderated by adults, and it's a sort of self-selecting group of of teens from you know they're mostly homeschooled kids from Catholic families, and I'm sure it's not perfect. I know that they've said that there was some bullying, and one child was asked to to leave the cafes. So it's 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 a human environment. It's not going to be without problems, but frankly, if it it would it's worth the price of admission even if we didn't the kids didn't take classes at homeschool connections. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I've been really pleased with it as a, a venue for them to get their feet wet in social media without diving into the deep end. 
and for getting some social interaction with other kids. Gosh, because, yeah, homeschooling for teens is hard. I would love for there to be more local teen groups for them to participate in, but there's just really nothing very local. I know your sister, when her kids hit the teen years, started a teen youth group that met at her house because there was nothing out there for her girls to right. do. That's just but not... Just, it's far away from us, and it's not. there's nothing like that around here. It's not really feasible just, for me. I don't really have room or time or energy or talent, frankly, for hosting that sort of gathering. I mean, if... Right, even if we wanted to host, there's no, there's no room in our house for And hosting. we don't have... I mean, she had a co-op of kids to draw from that right. they were already friends with, and we have, for lots of various reasons, just not developed friendships with people who are geographically there just doesn't seem close. to be a lot of homeschooling families catholic homeschooling families in this area this direct area it just yeah so but so they have this and that's been good and it's just the key i think is is to keep the lines of communication open i mean we still struggle a bit with things like um technology addiction not addiction but you know the use of technology and Stuff like that. Trying to work out with them and without in us, frankly, the right the right use of technology and and that sort of thing. It's hard, and I'm yeah. sure we are making mistakes. I I am positive oh, yeah. that we've made mistakes and will continue to make mistakes because we don't grow up with any guidelines for how to do this. And it's not like my own use of social media is always healthy. <laughs> right. Yeah, we both struggle with it too. And. I mean, I look, yeah, I mean, we've, we've definitely made mistakes and we're, we have some regrets of things that we we should have done before. And we can maybe share those at some point, um, some of the lessons learned. But, uh, but I think in general, it's lines of communication open. Talk, uh, uh, frankly, about this stuff. And, and frankly, I tell them, look, I make mistakes and sometimes I'm going to tell you, you know, do as I say, not as I do, because I am not a great role model in all of this stuff. And I want you to learn from some of my mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I try not to paint myself as as perfect and say, look, I, I'm going to I'm going to flub this sometimes. Right. Uh, but they have good hearts and they're really empathetic toward others. And that's the, that's a big part for them. And one thing I really love is the fact you know, Isabella has said that she's really learned this last year, the value of intercessory prayer and having a community of people who pray for each other. And that is a really amazing lesson for a, a teen to learn that to have to be a part of a community of people, of teens who pray for each other and support each other in difficult times. That's so important. And mm. that's something I certainly didn't really have as a teen that I really value. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's it's gorgeous to have her say, you know, at family prayers and pray for this person and this person and this person who are going through this and that and the other thing. And it's really developed her her empathy, but also her feeling that that prayer is real, that it makes real difference in people's lives. She's felt the difference in her own life when her friends have prayed for her. And so she knows that her prayers really do matter and make a difference to her friends. You know, being a teen can be a time where you get very self-centered and very inward focused. Right. Um, but it could also be a time where you become other focused and you start to notice the the world around you and the people around you and they become important in and of themselves. And I think that's very true in, in, our, in our, our girls that they are starting to do that, that outwardly noticing and focusing. And that's good. That's good. All right, uh, we should wrap things up before I turn into a pumpkin. <laughs> it is getting yeah, late it's getting for me. Late. So we do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create Raising the Bets, including Chris E., James S., Jonathan H., Ryan Z., and Paul E. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Raising the Bets and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. Find links from our discussion in our show notes at sqpn.com slash bets. That's B-E-T-T-S. Send us your feedback at the SQPN Facebook page, facebook.com slash starquestmedia, or send an email to bets at sqpn.com, B-E-T-T-S. Until next time, I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Emily Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Raising the Bets on StarQuest. 